From KPBS and PRX, this is Port of Entry, where we tell cross-border stories that connect us. I'm Alan Lilienthal. And quick warning, there are curse words in today's episode. A lot of them. There's also some mentions of suicide. So if you have young kids listening right now or those things bother you, you may want to sit this one out. When I was like 12 years old, it got real dark. And so I would just leave. I'd take care of them, make sure they were good. And then I would live my life as a junior adult. You know, and I'd go out and I'd skate with my homies and I'd try to figure out how to keep myself sane. This is Seth Sullivan. And the people Seth's talking about taking care of as a 12-year-old were his parents, who at the time were struggling with intense drug addictions. As long as they were good, right? As long as they had their medication, which was me going out and getting their medications most of the time. What was the medication? It was all prescription stuff, like temp cheese, like It was all pills and injected. But it's, uh, how do you responsibility for a 12-year-old? Well, now, I look back at it now, but for me, if I wanted to go skate, I had to do that first. So it wasn't like a responsibility at all. It was my obligation. Like it was, it was, oh, you want to go skate at two? Okay, well, you know what? You got to get done. You got to get us food and you got to get us this and then you can go and take off. Sometimes, sometimes I'd have cash to do it. Sometimes I got fronted this stuff and then we had to figure out how to pay for it later. But it was, it was always fight or flight. To me, it was always normal. You go through all the strife and feel there's bullshit, you just fix it. You know, you just go and you do something about it. You don't cry about it, you know, you just fix that shit. And, and so, we had no money, so I was like, well, what the fuck are we gonna do? Because these dudes are gonna die on me. They would go through withdrawals and it was, it was they're gonna die on me, bro. Like, it was, it was, so I was like, I need to hustle. That need to hustle, it pretty quickly led Seth to trouble. It was right after 9-11. So the border security had intensified. So once we get to the border, the dog immediately alerts them to the fact that there's something in the car. I felt this anxious, this dark, this sick feeling. When they start digging down deeper into the engine of the car, they're able to find the compartment. And so they pulled these packages out. That's when they started talking about me getting 10 to 15 years, me being the head of some sort of illicit operation. And it sank in that my life was just about to change drastically. And so I watched as they pulled the packages out and I watched as they bust one open. I I was devastated. I was just so let down because these people were my friends. Okay, so a lot of times, someone like Seth, a guy with a really challenging childhood and no dependable adults in his life, dudes like that sometimes get tossed aside. Discarded by a pretty cold justice system that doesn't really have the time or patience it takes to understand or even care about why an 18-year-old might be resorting to smuggling drugs through an international border. But for Seth, that difficult upbringing and the inner hustle it built, when Seth eventually learned how to channel it all, he became the goat at thrifting. He's brilliant when it comes to finding broken or thrown away things and turning them into absolute treasures. When you see what I do, it's it's definitely a byproduct of living in the city. It was a hustle. Like, it didn't start off as, oh, I want to be an artist. Not at all, dude. It started off as, I want to fucking survive, and I don't want to be depressed, because I don't want to shoot myself. I mean, Seth could have just thrown his life away at 18 when he got busted for drug smuggling, but he didn't. Instead, just like the discarded gems he finds, Seth saw value in himself and gave himself a chance at a second life. When did you start considering yourself an artist, not just a hustler? When I had the balls to say it for the first time. (laughs) 
I sing, I dance, I fucking I write hip hop. I do all kinds of weird shit that makes me feel good. But I only do that because of that, because it's therapy, it's medicine for me. It's not a hustle anymore, does that make sense? And the only way I've been able to get it to work is by doing it enough. You know, just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. Today's story kicks off our new season of Port of Entry. It's a season focused on artists and musicians who have turned pain into superpowers. More on Seth's cross-border story after the break. Nos vemos muy pronto. KPBS On Demand is supported by Illumina, a global leader in DNA sequencing, helping clinicians and researchers all over the world understand the genetics of disease to make personalized medicine a reality. From genetic testing to developing new vaccines to help protect people around the globe, Illumina DNA sequencing is impacting the future of healthcare. Discover more about the power of the genome by visiting illumina.com slash KPBS. Estamos de vuelta. What time is it? It's 10.30. It's time to start. I'll let you do your work. Thank you. This past summer, my producer Kinsey Moreland showed up to an auction at a huge warehouse outside of downtown San Diego. About a dozen people stood outside of a locked gate, then rushed in when a staffer officially opened the auction. (laughs) Buena suerte. Gracias. Behind the gate was a sea of secondhand furniture, clothes, exercise equipment, refrigerators, and other used items that would soon be auctioned off to the highest bidders. Oh, do you see anything here today? That oh, yeah, I see a oh, whole lot. Can whole you lot. show me? Yeah, sure, like all this, all this stuff on, over here. Any of these things, like these cabinets and these cabinets right here, yeah. this beautiful dining room table with the chairs. But what it's it is, like it's... barely used. Well, yeah, well, oh, you know, I don't like the word used. We got to say previously enjoyed. Ah, I like it. Rebranding. Yeah. This is Daniel. He's one of the biggest buyers of secondhand goods at auctions north of the border, which makes him one of the biggest resellers south of it. Oh, I do it by the truckloads. Okay, vamonos, let's go. Let's go, Joe. Mm. Come on for this thing. Come on first. Dame 30 por el 30. 30 por el 30. Right now they're bidding on this stuff. That refrigerator went for 100 bucks. It probably works. Somebody probably figured out it works and everything. So 15, 20 bucks for the stove. He does it in English and Spanish because most of the people, are, they only speak Spanish. But there's, you got, it's multicultural. Look at it, you know. Yeah, todo. Todo aquí. Vamos por aquí. Everything here. Give me $30. I'll say 30, 30. Daniel didn't want to give us his last name, by the way. In part because he's a businessman in Tijuana and he says that makes him a target for crime. He says he also wants to remain somewhat unknown to his competitors bidding on goods at these auctions. Anyway, Daniel buys used things at auctions like this one at Father Joe's in San Diego. Then he and his fleet of drivers take the goods to the port of entry in San Isidro where they're required to pay an 18% tax of the estimated value of the goods to the Mexican government before they can cross. Then Daniel sells this stuff at his huge secondhand store in Tijuana. My whole goal, my whole thing is like I tell all the people over here is keep the landfill stuff down. And it's not, we're not taking trash down to Mexico, but what it is is we're just trying to keep stuff down and try and supply people with stuff that can be reusable, upcycled, I guess you could say. Daniel, by the way, says the pandemic has totally rocked this corner of the cross-border world. Not as many people are donating stuff, not as many people are buying previously enjoyed items anymore, and the majority of the folks who used to cross to buy stuff can't cross right now because the border is still closed to Mexican citizens with tourist visas. But like usually on a, on a day like this today, you can't see through the radio, but this would be a big crowd of people. Yeah, we only see in a handful right now. Give me forty dollars, quarenta por el. Thank you. I say forty, forty, I'll say forty, forty-five. Seth Sullivan, better known as Art Pusher on Instagram, used to be one of those people lining up outside the gate at that auction in San Diego most mornings. 
and I would get up in the morning, dude, and this is when I just started smoking weed, bro. So I would take a blunt to the dome by myself, like a G of fucking very strong medical marijuana, and then I would drink a cup of coffee. So I would show up to this auction, fucking just going, just yeah! And everybody, everybody at the auction, my friends would have to tell them that no, Seth doesn't smoke crack, dude. They'd always be like, dude, does Seth smoke meth or crack or something? He's like, no, that's just how he is. <laughs> so, so yeah. Fueled by caffeine, cannabis, and his contagious natural enthusiasm, Seth got really, really good at being able to quickly spot the really valuable stuff amid the not so valuable stuff. And so it became a lifestyle, like this whole going to the auctions and buying and selling, like I started meeting other people doing it as a profession. So I started learning the hustle of the auctions, especially because auctions are complicated. Like you have to, you really have to know what you're doing. It's not just lifting up your hand at a price. Like people that are seasoned will drop things on you at a really elevated price. So you spend all your money and you don't come back. Like it's the craziest thing, dude. You think you're doing good and shit and then you look at your pockets, you got one couch, you're out 400 bucks and you didn't make any money that day. And so I started really getting to know the auctions and how to work that. No, for it, give me 75. So yeah, Seth became a picker, a person who finds secondhand things at auctions, thrift stores, and estate sales. Then he refurbishes those things and gives them a second life. Seth's buyers were mostly resellers, people who own higher-end antique stores or sell furniture and art directly to collectors. I figured out that that resellers were the easiest people to sell to because they always had a budget to buy because they needed to have inventory. Once you have a store, you don't have the time that it takes to pick on your own. So all these stores rely on pickers, people like me that are a middleman between basically the garbage dump and the millionaire. Seth quickly rose through the ranks to become one of the best pickers at the border because his rough childhood essentially groomed him for this kind of hustle. These days, Seth is at the top of his game. He went from being a picker with an eye for good design to being one of the top interior designers at the border. All right, so where do you want to start for the tour? Over the summer, Seth took my producer Kinsey and I on a tour of Hotel Lafayette. It's a hotel on Revolución in downtown Tijuana where he's heading up the interior design work. This piece of furniture in the entrance, this is multiple pieces, like seven pieces of furniture. We, they got deconstructed and rebuilt to make the front desk. Um, the television is also wood, so it just happened to fit right in there. And we're hooking this up to an original Nintendo on wireless controllers. So if you sit here and you're waiting for your room, you can play Mario and... The interior of the hotel shows off a lot of the salvaged things that Seth has turned from trash into design treasure. We started right past the entrance, where Seth created this beautiful and nostalgic front desk. Remember those wooden entertainment centers from the 80s and 90s, where our boxy TVs and Nintendos would go in our childhood homes? Imagine a bunch of those pieced into one single structure that looks like a front desk where the concierge stands. So, that, so I think I think that the whole key about this place was to make it fun, kitschy, and quirky. It's a commercial space; it's not someone's private home, so you can play with other people's feelings at the same time, right? You, which which I think is great about commercial spaces because you're not designing it for the customer. You know, you're designing it for their customers. Next, Seth showed us a big mirror he designed for the hotel lobby. There's something going on behind this mirror for sure. At first, it looked sort of like a basic large mirror, just a big rectangle with a frame covered in a collage of old San Diego Union Tribune newspaper clippings from decades ago. I can kind of see something on the other side. But when we got up close, Kinsey and I could tell there was something more going on. Definitely want to see it now. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> Woo, okay. Wow, that's... What do you see? Well, first, like the first thing that hit me with, like I was looking into infinity. Like for some reason, it just expanded the space a lot. Yeah. But there's these like, kind of old school Mexican mariachi type dolls marionettes. with sombreros, marionettes, <laughs> hanging <laughs> in the depths of the mirror that oh you wouldn't have seen God. if it's not turned on. That's amazing. That's so rad. <laughs> the the whole thing with this one was was to bring something in that really spoke of Avenida Revolución. And to me, when I was a kid, dude, seeing these things colorful, and then the vendors would always like 
entertain the kids with them when they're walking by and they would tell you how they'd guilt trip your parents into buying you one and so those things always rung rung a bell in my head and <laughs> it's it's fun it's it's cartoony it's playful Seth showed us a few more special things, whimsical, beautiful, very colorful things, and explained his process, which he says is sort of like a call and response game he plays with the space. My musician mind likened it to the process of musical improvisation, like jazz. What I do, I didn't study art, I didn't study design, so a lot of it I call it the plan is there's no plan. So a lot of it literally is freestyle, dude. So we figure out what materials we have, we look at the spaces, and it's, my fa- it's a complicated way to do it, but it's my favorite way to do it because you feel the space before you start messing with it. Um, I've worked with a plan before, I've worked with architectural plans before, and sometimes when you have too much of a plan, you don't really work the bones, soft. you know? Soft, soft plans, I like it. You don't work the bones of the project, you know? Um, but it's... You don't have a map, really. You don't have a map, dude. So it's, it's, it's been like you said, dude, it's been kind of like this jazz thing to where not just me, but the other contractors that are coming in are kind of doing the same thing, and it's worked out beautifully, dude. You know? So how did Seth get here? How did he go from drug pusher to art pusher? How did he become the guy who gets some of the most exciting design gigs on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border? Seth's story actually starts with his blue eyes and light skin, and an identity that inevitably leads to a little confusion and a lot of curiosity. Let's start at the beginning. You're not a traditional Tijuanense, but you really are. You're like you're the most representative of, of most people that I know. But where were you born? Where did your life start? Tijuana. Yeah, Tijuana. Yeah, I was born in Tijuana in the Hospital de la Mujer y el Niño. It's real. I'm really from born here. <laughs> most people don't believe that. I said, no, but wait. So why do you speak Spanish? And I'm like, well, I was born here. <laughs> I was raised here, and I've been here about like almost 30 years. It was so weird, it's so weird, but like your parents, they're like, so your mom's Mexican? No, 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 no. So your dad, he's Mexican? No, 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 no. So it gets confusing, it gets confusing, but yes. Trust me, dude, I get it. I feel like I'm very TJ. Yeah, you are, you are, though. Like, that is the funny thing. Like, you are the most, that is the most TJ thing. Like, from your parents are from somewhere else, and they, you are in TJ. So yeah, Seth's parents are from the U.S. Exactly why they moved to Tijuana is a bit fuzzy in Seth's brain. But he says Tijuana's alternative medicine scene was booming at the time, which made the city attractive to his parents, who had started dipping their toes into things like meditation and relaxation techniques. They ended up in TJ. My father got offered a medical facility, Valparaiso. It was like a hot springs in TJ. And they used to treat a lot of people for terminal illnesses. They would come in for cancer. They would come in for all kinds of incurable things that apparently on this side of the border, people were getting well. And so he ended up on this side of the border back in the 70s. They love Mexico and they ended up staying on here. And I don't know if it's because of the freedom that they had, but Tijuana back in that time, bro, was... It was a fast-moving city that had a bunch of money, and it showed it, and it spent it on itself, and it was a different place than it is right now. You know, it's just, it just felt different. Seth says early on, his parents found quick success, and he felt in awe of them. My mom was fucking, she was brilliant, bro. She could take a book, digest it in a couple days, 500 pages. She would just rifle through it. And then she would narrate it to my dad because my dad didn't like to read. And then you would look at this eccentric dude, right, which was my dad, which was incredibly accomplished in my eyes. I would watch this person give these incredibly sick people therapy, bro, and they would come out better. And all he did was talk to him and teach him how to meditate. For years, the niche that Seth's parents found really worked. Money was flowing in, and things were good for his family. Going to really nice parties, going to fucking having a beautiful home, like my parents having a great car, and fucking having things that that you just didn't see every day. To me, it was normal, because that's how we grew up. He had a bunch of friends that worked for the consulate. Everybody was moving and shaking, and it didn't get to his head, but it kind of, he was a fish out of water, bro. He was a, an American dude that didn't speak any Spanish. He always walked around with an interpreter. If he didn't have an interpreter, I was his interpreter. And so 
for him, he loved the city, but this, I, I feel like in Tijuana, if you don't eat, you get eaten. And I feel like he got eaten. So they just went through, just they spiraled into a deep depression and they both got addicted to prescription medications and it just started spiraling down from there, but. Little Kid Seth didn't want to hang out in his own house very much during that time. Instead, he found himself a skateboardized escape hatch. Skateboarding, that saved my life, bro. I skateboarded through all of TJ, and that's how I would get away from my home. Those are the best memories I have, dude. What skateboarding does for you is that you fall and you get back up. You fall and you get back up. So I really, dude, I feel like skateboarding. If I hadn't had that shit and I wouldn't have learned to every time you fall and it hurts, you got to get back up. I, bro, I don't think I know. I, I, I literally say skateboarding saved my life. So when Seth was outside skating the streets of Tijuana, everything was fine. But inside his home with his parents, things were totally falling apart. But instead of crumbling alongside everything else, Seth eventually stepped up and started to hustle. You remember ASR? Do you, do you all ever remember Action Sports yeah, Retail? Yeah, down at the, okay. like, the Right. Yeah, yeah, so we would cross, all these TJ skater kids would cross to ASR. It was a big skateboarding, it was an action sports retail. And it was the biggest skateboarding convention in the world. And so you could go and you could meet all the pros, all the vendors, you could see all the big companies. And so we would make up these, should I even say that, should I share those? We would make up these fucking business cards dude that said that we own skate shops we were fucking 15 16 bro and we would go with our business card to the head desk and the head desk they would trade your business card for it they would sign you up you'd register and then they'd give you a badge well bro having a asr badge was like i don't even know how to explain it dude you would go in there and you would come out of there with 100 thrasher magazines because every vendor would hook you up with something boards yeah, 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 yeah shoes, shirts, and that's where you would go to try and get sponsored. So we would go with all our sponsor me tapes with a fucking dream, dude, coming from TJ, knowing we're going to San Diego, we're going to California, this is where all the big shit is. And we would take our sponsor me tapes and see what happened. I remember I got a sponsor out of San Francisco, this company called Elevate Trucks. These terrible trucks, bro, but they sponsored me, bro. And they gave me a pair of trucks. And so that's what we do. And I would bring back all this product that we would get gifted and I would set up a little, like a little shop at the skate park and we would sell and that's what we did we figured out how to hustle so the hustler part of seth was born but the skating thing wasn't pulling in enough cash seth still needed a day job to help pay all the bills and i needed to make cash bro so i get offered this hustle by one of my friends he's like dude why don't we why don't you you see what we do why don't you do that with us what his friends did though was smuggling drugs across the border Seth's 18-year-old brain rationalized the work. So I understood, but I didn't get it. Like, it wasn't a physical thing in my brain that said, red alert, this is, regardless if it's right or wrong, this is going to put you in a shit situation if you're not careful. Seth essentially became a drug smuggler, crossing weed through the port of entry from Tijuana to San Diego. He got away with it a bunch of times, but eventually his luck ran out. So I take off that morning, it's fucking freezing, and I'm headed to meet this person with this car that has whatever in it. Now, so I get there, I'd never met the person that was driving. We get to the border, I can tell she's super nervous, and when we get to the border, she loses it. She starts telling a story about how we'd been weeks in Mexico, there was not one piece of luggage in the car. That's when I started sweating. The car had just been washed. There's not even a speck of dust in the car. And that's when the officer opens the trunk. Now, as soon as he opens the trunk, he looks through the window and I can tell he's looking at us. And then he comes over and he starts questioning us. He's like, well, if you've been there for two weeks, he's like, why don't you have anything in your car? And she didn't know what to say. So she starts trying to make up the story. She fumbles through it. She's super nervous. The dude knows something's up. He puts the little secondary tag on the window, sends us to secondary. Still, I've heard all these stories about people getting caught with weed for the first time at the border, and I'm still not nervous, I'm still not scared. I still know, I don't even think, I know it's gonna be a slap on the wrist. From there, it didn't take long for the drug dogs to find what was hidden in a secret compartment built into the car. 
So they handcuff me to a steel table and I'm watching as this goes down. And I look over at her, I can tell she's gonna immediately just start spilling this soup. So they find this compartment that I didn't know existed behind the engine of the car and they start yanking on something that's attached to a cord and they pull the cord out and there's multiple bricks attached to the cord it's like a system right and when they bust that shit open I could tell real quick that shit wasn't weed they dug into the packages and they realized it was cocaine that's when my fucking heart I, my God, I didn't know what was going on. I felt deceived. I felt sad. Seth got convicted and sent to prison in San Diego. Walking through the rows of cells for the first time, he remembers thinking he needed to act as tough as possible. You can see up like at least four or five stories where there's all these dudes, all walks of life, staring down at the newcomers coming into this prison. Well, I was 147 pounds soaking fucking wet, dude. I was this little noodle of a person. I saw myself as prey. Like as soon as I walked in, the first thing that you know is like, you better knock out the first motherfucker that says something stupid because you gotta set your place. Like that's what I've been told, what, what I heard, what I've seen in the movies. And so the first thing I hear is, mm, I'll take the little blonde one. And I was like, oh. and so I walk in and some dude grabs me by the shoulder. And so immediately I turn around with my fist up and he puts his hand on my forehead and he's like, chill, Seth. And I was like, Seth? And I look over and it's one of my fucking neighbors who was in there for the same thing. And he goes, bro, you're so lucky. He's like, you eat already? Compared to his stressful home life, Seth says his time behind bars was actually sort of therapeutic. When I went to prison, bro, it was so much better than being at home. <laughs> like, real talk, bro, it was so much better than being at home. These two dudes fucking adopted me as like, I was so skinny, they called me Stick Boy. I was Stick Boy. Hey, Stick Boy, what up, Stick Boy? And so they were so worried about me being like this little frail thing that they were like, we're going to start a training, like a training thing for Stick Boy. So I got up every morning at 5.30 in the morning, and I would do a 1,000 push-ups in an hour with these dudes, and I would do that every day until I could do them like nothing. And once they realized that I was going to be good, that I had the personality that would get me through my situation, um, they sent me on my way. I came out of jail. I was 147 pounds when I went in. I came out looking like fucking Bruce Lee, bro, because all we did was worked out. Three years later, Seth got released from prison. He was 21. And he says he felt both physically and mentally stronger. But when he crossed the border back into Tijuana, he found that his parents had sunk even deeper into their addictions. And when I came back out of that was when they were at their worst point. About a couple months later, dad decides to shoot himself. He was done. He's like, you know what, Seth? I can't take it anymore. I can't, I can't be here anymore. This shit's way too loud. He was an intellect. He was always used to having things flowing right in some way or another so when things weren't flowing and he didn't have money and he didn't know what to do because he felt powerless and he's in a country that's not his country bro and so it got to the point where he ends up shooting himself mom gets real bad dude mom has a heart attack and so i go out to do the same thing i always used to doing right so i go to the pharmacies i get all their shit i purchased it with some fucking some wonk weird ass prescription that wasn't even legit they end up selling me all this shit and then i come out of the pharmacy with a jacket and i had this military jacket with all these little hidden pockets and shit and i'd stuffed everything in my jackets because that's what you did and so i come out and i get approached by two officers right and they're like hey what do, can we talk can we talk to you i was like no but so like you know i speak to him in spanish and i'm like what do you need Seth was busted. Again. The cops put him in cuffs. And so back in the day, they had this thing called Delegación Móvil, where they had this police truck that was parked right by the border. And it was basically like a, like a little command center. I don't know what the fuck you call it. Like this little police truck, no? So these dudes are laughing. They fucking scored. They're about to, 
they're about to put me in jail, bro. And so I get into this this uh, little command truck. I'm handcuffed. They put all the stuff out on the table. They're telling me I'm looking at years, bro. Looking at 10 years in jail, bro. We'll continue Seth's border story after a quick break. No quieren perder ese esto. Get the latest news right now on NPR One. The NPR One app lets you pick the local or national stories you like and hear only what you want, when you want. You can also listen live or discover new content like podcasts. Find NPR One in your app store. Estamos de vuelta. Okay, so there was Seth cuffed, sitting in that mobile police center in Tijuana, and he decided to tell one of the police officers why he had all those prescription drugs. So I explained to him the situation. I explained to him that that my mom was addicted to, to different types of medications and that she, if I didn't get the shit back to her, she was going to go through withdrawals and it was going to be a real fucked up situation. My dad had just shot himself. She just had a heart attack. I was like, bro, I swear to you, this isn't me being shady. <laughs> this is just me living my life. And so, listen to this, bro. This is the most powerful fucking thing, dude. Out of the back of this truck, the door opens. And this dude goes, he's like, where did your dad shoot himself? And I was like, in La Cacho. He's like, oh, dude, I was there. He's like, I was there yesterday. He's like, take the cuffs off of him. Bro, they took the cuffs off of me. They gave me all the medication back, and they fucking sent me home, homie. <laughs> they sent me home. He's like, let him go. Just from him knowing I wasn't telling wow. him, I wasn't lying, bro. So Seth avoided what might have been a decade behind bars, and he was beyond relieved. But it's not like all his problems were solved right then and there in that lucky moment, because his mom was in real bad shape. So with some money from his grandma, Seth figured out how to use their U.S. citizenship status, and he had his mom transported from their house in Tijuana to a hospital on the other side of the border in San Diego. Again, Seth was relieved, but also sick with anxiety about how he was going to pay the hospital bills. First night I'm in the hospital, dude, I'm bawling my eyes out, dude. One of the nurses comes over and she's like, can I help you? And I was like, I don't know. She's like, have you filled out your insurance papers? And I was like, dude, we don't have insurance. And she's like, can you tell me what's going on? And so I sat down explaining with her, it's this older Mexican lady, dude, and she's like, mijo, I'm going to help you. She's like, you're going to have to sign a lot of papers, but we're going to get this shit done. And bro, that fucking lady sat down with a stack of like fucking, I don't know, 100 sheets of paper. And she just made me sign shit. And by a week later, uh, my mom was fully insured, bro. Like we didn't have to worry about anything. Everything was taken care of. So it went from, it was this roller coaster of just these wild things, dude. And all they were were lessons. It was just me trying to keep my eyes open to try and learn from this shit. Because if not, dude, it would have broken me. What doesn't break, though, sometimes it just gets better at bending. And Seth, he became really good at bending. With his dad gone and his mom being cared for in a hospital, finally, Seth was free to focus on himself. Just himself. And that's when he found his creative maker side. My mom taught me how to make candles when I was younger. And I realized that I like the process of making them. So I figured out how to make a mold. My mom told me about this day where her and my dad were on the beach making sand candles. And that memory always stayed in my mind. She told me that they made a tent with sheets. And in this tent, they made a dip in the sand. And they took a bunch of candles and they melted them out on their little fire. And then uh, you wet the sand and it becomes a mold. So you suspend your, your wicks in there and you can make this organic, natural shape mold. Well, I figured out how to put object into those molds. So I would take a piece of driftwood and I would use that as my base. And then I would build the candle around it. When you pulled the whole thing out of the sand, you had this sculptural piece of wood attached to this beautiful candle. And so they're really different. Thank you. 
Seth got some impressive mileage out of those candles, but he still needed a day job. And despite the felony on his record, he was able to score some good gigs. And in every job he took, he almost always excelled. He eventually found what he thought might be his true calling when he got hired at a high-end hotel in downtown San Diego as a concierge. That was like shooting fish in a barrel, bro. The tips were astronomical, and all we had to do was be connected enough to get these people what they wanted. But cue the existential crisis. Seth says he was making more money than he had ever dreamed of as a kid who grew up hustling in Tijuana. But he wasn't feeling fulfilled. So when his grandma passed and left him a little over 30 grand, Seth quit his job and decided he'd take some time to figure out what he really wanted to do with the rest of his life. That financial cushion, though, didn't last Seth long enough to ponder his life options. I'd never had money like that before. And so I just threw it away. Like, I literally the threw that shit away. Like it was total, total, total <laughs> low-budget rapper, dude. Just fucking blow that shit. So it was back to hustling for Seth. And so it got to the point, dude, where I had no money for rent. And I was like, what am I going to do? Well, I'd collected all these things to make my house look good, right? So I wanted to have, if I was going to have a home, I wanted to curate it with stuff that I liked. So I bought all this mid-century modern stuff. And I had spent maybe a thousand bucks, dude, to pimp out my house, right? When I ran out of money, I looked at all this stuff and I said, I'm going to sell all this shit. And I was able to make 10 times my money, bro. All this thrifted stuff. So a coffee table that was probably like 80 bucks and I refinished it and I sold it for like five, 600 bucks. And I sold all my stuff and I was left with nothing. And that's when I realized this is going to be my hustle. Art Pusher was born. Seth quickly rose through the ranks of pickers. Like, I've gone and taken high-end furniture from recycling places here in TJ, dude, because since they don't know here what it is either, it came across the border as something really important. But once it got here, it's just another object that's either it's metal or wood or what do we use it for? Because here, for the longest, things had to be useful. Like, for it to be valuable, it had to be useful. So I started realizing that, and I would go around, dude, to all these salvage yards, finding all these things that were coming from the U.S., and I would either restore them or just drive them right back across the border and just drop them off with who actually knew what they were. But, they, but they'd but they left the United States with the person not knowing what they were either. So that's what I did, dude. I started digging different uh, galleries, boutiques in L.A. that bought antiques, hard-to-find things, and I just found a client for different things that I liked. So like Necromance in LA, you know, which is this store that sells oddities and fucking meta weird medical things and bones and shit like that. Like anything that I would find, I would take to them. And then anything mid-century, I'd take to this dude or anything um, architectural salvage, I'd take to this person. Because I realized that it was something incredibly rewarding. If And if I did it right, the profit margins were astronomical, dude. Like if I knew how to buy and I knew how to sell, like your margins were like nothing else, dude. You're not doubling your money. Sometimes you're 30 times in your money, bro. Sometimes you're buying a sculpture for 10 bucks and selling it for 300 bucks. But you can't just be selling something. You gotta know where it came from. You gotta know who made it. You gotta know what year, what series, what style, if this color's rare. And so that became really important, especially in, in furniture. Because yeah, it could be from the 60s or 70s. Yeah, it could be modern and cool, but there's certain pieces out there that are like relics, like those, those, those my precious, like those things, you know, that you only find one. Luckily for Seth, he'd been trained to know some of this stuff early on. His mom actually taught him how to recognize quality in old things. We would go, as a kid, I would go to thrift stores to stay at sales, mostly in San Diego. We lived in Tijuana. She would take me to school in San Diego. When I was little, I went to kindergarten over there. And every, every time that we would cross the border, she had to hit a bookstore, an antique furniture store, and a thrift shop. And so she taught me, instead of looking at brand names and instead of looking at how do you explain this? Like the information behind a product. So if you look at if you look at something by Fendi or Gucci or Prada or a really nice piece of furniture, like you can see the craftsmanship. Like it's not only, you can see it. So she taught me about craftsmanship. So she taught me about materials. She taught me about time that it would take to build anything. She would be like, okay, Seth, look at this nail. She would be like, look at how it's placed in the hole. Look at how it didn't dent the wood. And look at how long, look at how many nails and look at how long it took. And look, so I started learning about materials and I realized that if you collect things that are already made well, you'll be able to turn them into something. Seth's new career was taking off, 
and so was his love life. It was around this time that he met Alexis, the woman who would become his wife. Meeting her was really interesting because I see this Korean girl, right? She's Asian, and her first language is Spanish. So I was like, oh shit, it's kind of like me, right? Because I didn't, you know, I definitely don't look Mexican. And my first language was Spanish, and my culture was very Mexican, and so was hers. And so, uh, so it was just, it was very cool. We got this cool little click. Somehow, Seth convinced Alexis to quit her stable, adulty job as a banker and instead help him turn his knack for buying and selling goods into launching an interior design company. Seth says he had a solid plan for the business, a plan that relied on his stool. This is what I called this stool, bro. I'd call it my stool sample. <laughs> and it was a stool, and it's actually called the Primero stool, and it's the first piece of furniture that I designed. And, um, and we were able to produce this stool in volume. And I would take this one stool, bro, it's the only one I had, and I'd be like, hey, can I show you my stool sample? And, they, and that would get me in the door, right? And so I would go with different architects until this one dude, I, I went to go show this architect this stool, and he's like, dude, it's really cool. He's like, will you sell me a pair? And I was like, I, just, I can't sell you a pair, bro. It needs to be like for a project where I can sell you in volume so that I can sell them to you. And so I left all fucking broken down, dude. And I had no money, bro. No money, no plan. The stool was my plan. And as I was walking out of this architectural firm, I catch up with this other dude and he goes, hey, where'd you get that? It's another architect that was having a meeting there that day. And I was like, well, I made it. He's like, well, can you make a lot of them? And I was like, fuck yeah, I can. And those stools ended up in Kettner Exchange. Kettner Exchange, by the way, is a really popular, fancy restaurant in the Little Italy neighborhood of San Diego. And after that, the magic of word of mouth marketing did its thing. With help from Alexis, the two of them built a successful cross-border interior design business. Eventually, they moved from San Diego back to Tijuana to make the business work better. And I realized that our life was going to be fabricating here in Mexico, or at least building things here in Mexico that we take back to the U.S. Because I was way more resourceful over here than I was over there. Over there, it like you, you talk to me and you hear the way that I speak English, and you would just assume that I would be like a fish in water over there. But I'm not, bro. Like it's completely foreign to me. Like I mean, I I got a weird American upbringing in Tijuana because I was raised by American parents. But but it wasn't it wasn't. It wasn't the culture of being in the States. So I came back here, and then it was kind of that sink or swim moment, you know, where I started getting jobs here, which was incredibly difficult because nobody wanted to pay, right? They want what you do, but they don't want to pay for it. And so it was, it's been really difficult to convince this side of the border that what I do is worth, you know, it's like an exchange, and it's like an even exchange. And so I would just go back across the border, and I'd offer my job, my work over there, and then I would live over here, and then we'd... I bro, I don't even know. It was such an organic thing. It was such a, it was such a like every day was just hustle, 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 and and never taking any time off, and still struggling, and but it started becoming like that whole struggle, not struggle, became like emotion, and um, and that's why Tijuana became so valuable in what I do. Seth says so many aspects of his life at the border, from navigating two cultures and wrong assumptions about his identity, to spending hours and hours waiting to cross into the U.S to becoming scrappy at a young age in order to survive his childhood has 100% made him who he is. The border is definitely, dude, even even the patience that waiting through that fucking border has given me, bro. Like, mm. everything about the border, dude. I get asked all the time, hey, Seth, what if you were raised in the States? Do you think you'd be the same? Fuck, no, dude, who knows what I'd be, but I wouldn't be this, you know, and I like this. You know? I'd, so, yeah, dude, this is, being from Tijuana is fucking, it's been for me uh, a way to be proud of, proud of what I am, you know, mm. because it's been a fucking struggle, bro. It's, it's been wild, so... Back on our tour of that hotel in Tijuana, the one Seth was in the middle of designing when we met up last summer, Seth pointed out some of the pieces he thinks are really special. When I started looking at rackets, I realized that these wooden tennis rackets were steam bent. He's really proud of his own artwork he made specifically for the hotel, like the chandelier made of tennis rackets hanging over the front desk. 
it's really more of a hanging sculpture than a light fixture. Like it's it's all wood that's bent in a mold, but it's still wood. Like and and wood you can always either sand it, refinish it, retouch it. And so when I started thinking about building things, I was like, okay, start collecting things that are that are good on their own, and then they'll always look good as a constellation. So the rackets came as part of a collection, part of this ridiculous hoarding thing that I do, and uh, and I have probably over. 700 rackets in my possession waiting for a large sculpture and so when it came time to build a chandelier for the for the entrance of the hotel I started digging through all my stuff and I found my rackets and it just made sense it made sense that the four inch the three inch bulb looked like a tennis ball it made sense that it that by putting the collection together it looked like the tennis ball was in play and um, and and the taking the object out of context is what makes it so playful so what one thing that I try to implement into to design that we do is called is constant conversation. Always giving someone something to talk about and that way your project speaks on its own without having to necessarily market what you're doing. So the space kind of talks for itself. Um, and so this was part of that. Now how can I give someone something to talk about? And that felt like something you'd talk about. Another conversation piece by Seth a metal sculpture hanging in the hotel stairwell that he made out of rusted metal dustbins. So these are all dustpans that never got sold. And uh, I bought over 150 dustpans from this dude and he contacted me because he didn't want these things to go to the trash. He's like, Seth, dude, bro, can you come and do something with these, please? So I went into this warehouse, bought all these dustpans. I bought all, a bunch of... Um, you think so? you squish tortillas with? Not oh, tortillera. 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 <laughs> I bought a bunch of tortilleras, which we're going to build another sculpture in here for. But again, this is just me picking from my inventory and, and trying to figure out how to reappreciate these things as art. So yeah, more and more, Seth has started stretching out the definition of design. By putting his own original artworks into his projects and blurring the line between artist and designer. And people are really liking what they see. I'm just out here being a cowboy dude and then I realized I could do it. I was like, okay, let me recommend this. And then I would put this piece of art in there and they'd be like, who made that? Well, Seth made it. And then I started becoming an artist because then I was now making things that were mine, but I was placing them in commercial projects with big budgets. Seth still likes doing the design projects, but recently he started realizing that what he likes even more is making his own art and music. One of the first but really huge steps to Seth shedding his designer skin and becoming an artist was what he calls the purge. After years and years of being a picker, he had amassed warehouses filled with used things he collected. It took him months to sort through everything and get rid of most of it. He says it was a super painful process. But once he let go of things, instead of dreaming about one day giving those things a second life, he felt sort of reborn himself. I purged and I, and I made my surroundings smaller because that gave me a, a center of focus. Mm. So it helped me heal like a lot of things, like a lot of dependency that I had on things because I was attached to things because... Because that's what my parents did. That's what I watched them do. They just hoarded shit like that's what they did. And so it was a it was a cool thing. I started being able to kind of like work on my myself through getting rid of things that were incredibly hard to get rid of. Have you been able to stop picking and collecting? No, no, that's it's a permanent illness. That yeah. no, you know what though? I toned it. I toned it down hard. Like before, I would leave the house, and there's never an hour to get home. If there's a thrift store, I'm gonna stop. If there's a fucking stay, I'm gonna stop. And I don't do that anymore. Like I realized that that now my focus is creating things. So if I'm, if I'm gonna stop and buy anything, it's gonna be materials, but it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be something to flip because I already got what I needed to get from that, which was all the inspiration of so many years of touching so many objects, realizing that other people had made all these incredible things that I admired. So now my whole thing is me making things that I admire. Seth is starting to navigate his new career path as an artist and maybe even a musician. He's actually recording a song of his for the first time ever this month. He says as he moves forward in his life, he finds himself thinking back about his past and his parents a lot. He sees their influences all the time, in his design work and now in his artwork and music too. Seth's mom passed away back in 2018. Her years of drug abuse finally took their toll. I 
was holding her hand when she died and it was just difficult because she kept screaming no, like she didn't want to go. It fucking sounds terrible to say, but it was just such a relief because it was such a difficult situation. It was hard because it was my mom, but I realized this was part of her path and I had to be okay with that. But it's just everything behind it was so hard to kind of detangle emotionally for me to figure the fuck out to where I could be okay with it. And I'm still trying to figure out if I'm okay with the way that all of that went down. But it doesn't matter, it is what it is. I'm very grateful for being what I am as a byproduct of all this shit. Seth says he thinks about his parents all the time. He constantly sees their fingerprints in everything he does. They were beautiful people, bro. They were cool people. But life and whatever, the way that they looked at it got the best of it, you know? But, but... Again, going back to feeling TJ, that felt, it's that shit, I mean, that felt very TJ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it felt very TJ. Just the struggle of being here, you know, the struggle of living here, surviving here, trying to do something, you know, with your life that feels, it doesn't feel like you're not doing anything, you know? So, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> So when you were so when you were doing pre you becoming an artist, I guess like viewing it as more of a hustle, I guess like buying stuff and reselling it and stuff like that. Did you consider yourself an artist? Like, did you were you, were you thinking you wanted to make at some point design your own stuff? I was just trying to survive. Yeah, I was just trying to survive and go and trying to do something that didn't feel like it was sucking my soul. So for me, I started realizing that there's got to be something more, dude. There's got to be something more. You get one ride in this fucking meat suit, right? And the more context, the more idea, the more thought I put into my things, I realized that the more information people receive from them. So I started taking it serious because after that, I was like, dude, if you're going to be doing shit out in the world, you better do that shit right because people are paying attention. So now I take it a little more serious. That shit made me feel better about myself, bro. Because for the longest time, I was like, fuck, what? What am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? It took years. It took till I was probably like a couple years ago, maybe three, four years ago, maybe where I said, you know what, dude? People would ask and be like, I'm an artist, but now I'm committed to it. Before I wasn't committed to it because I wasn't sure, you know, but now I'm sure. You can see photos of Seth's artwork and design on his Instagram page. He's at ArtPusher. While you're there, follow us at Port of Entry Pod. And we mentioned suicide in today's episode. If you're having thoughts of suicide, you can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255 or the San Diego Access and Crisis Line at 888 888- 724-7240. Port of Entry is written and produced by Kinsey Moreland. Emily Jankowski is the co-producer and director of sound design. Alisa Barba is our editor. Lisa Morissette is Operations Manager, and John Decker is the Interim Associate General Manager of Content. I'm your host, Alan Liliental. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Thank you for listening.
KPBS On Demand is supported by Illumina, a global leader in DNA sequencing, helping clinicians and researchers all over the world understand the genetics of disease to make personalized medicine a reality. From genetic testing to developing new vaccines to help protect people around the globe, Illumina DNA sequencing is impacting the future of healthcare. Discover more about the power of the genome by visiting illumina.com/kpbs.